Thank you for tuning to the Digital Church. Good morning, church. We are so happy to be with you, even if it is remotely or virtually. Um, we uh, totally believe that when two or three are gathered um, in the name of the Lord, that he is here. And so um, we are going to worship, and then we just ask that you worship along with us. So um, pretend like you are here in this room with us, or, I mean, hopefully you're in your jammies. That's where I would be at home if I were here. Um, but please, sing along with us as we worship the Lord today.
our communal prayer time. Um, our district has called us to rally around a specific scripture, uh, 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. And that actually says, this scripture reads, Then if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sins and I will restore their lands. Um, our district has, has placed the scripture on our minds today so that we may cry out and, and, and ask God to help heal our lands of this pandemic. Um, so as, as you're at home, at work, or wherever you're at, um, just go ahead and take a posture um, that's fitting for you. Kneel at your bed, kneel at your couch, kneel before your um, entertainment center, however you're watching this. Um, and, and cry out to God with us as we pray uh, for His assistance during this pandemic. Let us pray. Father God, thank you for this day. Thank you for the powers of the interweb so that we can do digital church in a time when we're separated. Father, I pray that you would heal our lands, that you would hear our cries, and that you would begin to lift up your people. That even though we are in such crazy and chaotic times, uh, in, in a dark time in our day, that you would use us to be a light, that people would see, that people would have hope, that you would use this time to rebuild neighborhoods, rebuild communities, to rebuild neighborhood relationships. Help us live outside the walls that we found ourselves so comfortable. Father God, I pray that you would pour in us your spirit. Help us to continue to be that light and hope in this time of darkness. And we pray, Lord, that your hand would be all upon this pandemic and that you would bring it to an end. We pray for those families that are suffering through this, Lord, those that have lost loved ones, those that have gotten positive results. We pray that you would be with their families, that your healing hand would be upon them and that where courage is needed, where healing is needed, where comfort is needed, you would give those things, Lord, and that you would be with your children, as you've promised. Father, we thank you for everything you're going to do, and I pray your hands be on this service, even though it's a digital service. I pray that you would use our prayers. I pray that you would use Pastor Josh to speak to our hearts, to move us in such a way uh, that we would act your love out every day in our lives. It's in your name we pray. Amen. And thank you again for joining us here on Digital Church. Um, we're just going to go through a couple of announcements real quick. We just want to remind you to watch your email inboxes and keep track of our Facebook page. Um, any updates concerning the church or any needs or any things like that that you have, you can post there or we will post uh, in your emails and in the Facebook uh, post section. So if you have any questions, uh, feel free to interact with us and uh, uh, put out your prayer requests there or in the comment section below uh, and just keep a conversation going during this time when we're we're separated. But we want to keep everyone updated. So if you have any questions or if we can do anything, please let us know um, and we'll send out those requests via email and Facebook posts. Um, we want to remind you that Monday through Friday, me and Pastor Josh are still doing the First and Second Timothy devotionals, the daily readings. Uh, you can tune in and uh, watch those every day. And if you haven't uh, started watching those, you can go back and catch up. All those videos are on YouTube right now. And you can just go back and watch them all at once um, to keep track and, and just kind of read along with us. To stay connected, even though we're disconnected physically. Um, also, we want to remind you that the, chid, the kids have church too. Uh, they have digital church. We've been mailing out uh, their papers and activities that they can do at home with you guys um, and if you have kids and you didn't receive uh, any of those papers let us know uh, in the comments below or email us and we'll put you on to that mailing list so we can send those papers out to you also there are videos that they can watch um, at 252 studios you can click on that link below we'll put that down below in the description and we'll also have that on our Facebook page you just click on that it'll take you to those kids videos and you can watch their life app videos uh, we watched this past week's with our kids. It was pretty funny. It was awesome to do church with our kids. I encourage you to do it because they need church too. They need just as much Jesus as we do. Um, 
And also, if for any other reason you need to drop something off at the church, we'll have someone there from 10 to noon this week, uh, Monday through Friday. It'll either be Miss Carolyn or Pastor Josh, but if you have anything you need to drop off there, you can do that uh, 10 to noon, Monday through Friday. Um, and real quick, I want to cover the last announcement is Parsonage for Nurses. Um, we're seeing a need all over our country and a lot of really hard hit areas for our nurses. A lot of nurses are getting sick and a lot of nurses are exposed to this uh, COVID-19 and don't want to bring it home to their children. And so what they're doing is they're staying in hotels, they're staying with friends, they're staying in Airbnbs so they don't take it home. And what we're doing is we want to prepare. Um, and worst case scenario, if our nurses down here that begins to happen. We want to offer our parsonage up as a, a safe haven, a place to stay, um, so that they don't take this, this sickness back home to their loved ones, um, a place that they can rest and, and, and catch up for their next shift. Um, as, as we pray, we hope things don't get that bad. But if it does, we want to be prepared to be the hands and feet and, and move in our community and offer hope to these families who are on the front lines of this pandemic. So if you have any beds, um, or air mattresses that you might be able to help. I think we need about four or five um, that we can put in the rooms there. Um, you could drop those off at the church and we'll put those in those rooms and we'll get ready um, just in case we need that. And we can offer that as a, an assistance, as a help for these nurses. Um, you, you never know. And, and it's going to be a lot of people that Kristen knows that have long, little ones, loved ones that they just don't want to take this home to. Um, so if you can give to that, that would be fantastic. And the very, very last reminder is online giving. This is usually the time in our service where we pass the plates. Uh, but here in Digital Church, we just ask you to remain faithful and uh, use your app to give. Uh, if you don't know how to use the app, that's fine. You can use your computer and you can go to our website, www.ecnas.org, and go to the donations page to give there. Um, if you don't want to do that, you can actually text. You can do, there's so many other ways you can give right now. You can actually mail in a check too if that works. But we just want to remind you to be faithful and to continue to give. And God will always continue to be faithful as we as we go through these trying times. Um, and as always, allow me to pray for these tithes and offerings. Even though we're not passing the plates, uh, please allow me to pray a blessing over these givings. Let's bow. Father God, thank you for Digital Church. Thank you for online giving. Thank you for ways to stay connected in a time when we're told to be disconnected. I pray that you, Lord, would use these offerings, these tithes and these offerings to build your kingdom, Lord, that you would bless the gift and the giver, and that through these givings, you would use it to build up your church so that we could be hands and feet in a time when our communities, when our, when our people need hands and feet the most. Lord, I pray that we would be those hands and feet through tithes and giving, through hope and life, through our love and through our actions. It's in your name we pray. Amen. On this fifth Sunday of Lent, I invite you to close your eyes and to consider the word sanctuary. A sanctuary is a place set aside for sacred things. It is a place of refuge and protection. Our church is a sanctuary. The season of Lent is a kind of sanctuary, extended in time. One of the things Lent teaches is that we ourselves are sanctuaries, too. There inside each of us is a place for sacred things, a place where God abides. In today's Gospel text, John 11, 1 through 45, we learn that a very dear friend of Jesus, a man named Lazarus, has grown ill and passed away. What makes matters worse is that before he died, his sister Mary and friend Martha sent for Jesus knowing that Lazarus was in grave danger. Before Jesus could make his way to where they were, Lazarus passed away. When Jesus finally arrives, not only is his friend dead, but he's faced with the questions and disappointment of Mary and Martha. This isn't the only time, though, that those close to Jesus will doubt him. Later in the Passion story, when Jesus is humiliated, beaten, and nailed to the cross, his followers will again be tempted to resort to doubt and despair. On this fifth Sunday of Lent, the symbol we place on the communion table amongst the other symbols is a hammer and three nails. 
As we ponder them, may we be thoughtful of the fact that we too often ask the wrong question. God, how could you let this happen? As opposed to the right question, God, what good can you bring about through this? Please join me in confessing the words on your screen. Loving God, as we extinguish our fifth Lenten candle this morning, our hearts are open to you. Forgive us for sometimes thinking that our ways are better than yours. In the quiet places of our souls, show us the joy that comes from fully trusting in you. Transport us, transform us from quarters of your love to givers of your love. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, uh, good morning or good evening or whatever it is when you happen to uh, to watch this service, I guess. Um, yeah, it's kind of weird. Uh, I am coming to you not from the uh, the the platform and behind the podium at, uh, at at the church, but I'm actually coming to you from my back porch. Um, and it's actually Saturday evening, and it's a beautiful uh, man. It's a beautiful evening. Um, the uh, the sun is setting off to my right, and uh, you'll probably hear some birds chirping in the background a little bit. You may hear a little bit of traffic uh, from from Beulah Road. We're a few houses off of Beulah Road, but um, but man, thanks for tuning in. Uh, whenever it is that you happen to watch this, um, it, worship has become so interesting these days. But I'm I'm thankful. I couldn't be more thankful than I am that we can can stay connected, uh, even if it's through the the lens of a camera. Um, know that you are you deeply missed. I uh, miss being together. Um, I guess we'll see what this next week holds in terms of what rules and regulations are as far as gatherings go. But man, it's just hard to know what's next and and when this whole Corona thing is is gonna going to start winding down. Um, anyway, um, let's leave that business for another time and let's let's dive into the message this morning. Uh, again, just thank you so much for, for tuning in and, and for leaning in. Um, I'm, I'm breaking my own rule again uh, this week. Um, I, the same thing happened that happened a couple of weeks ago. Um, <clears throat> the gospel text for today, I ended up preaching on during our Stories of Invitation series and so I ended up going with a different one of the, the lectionary texts today. Um, the, the text that I'm going with is out of the book of Ezekiel. I don't think I've ever preached out of the book of Ezekiel. Uh, if you've ever read it, then you probably know why. It's a, it's a very interesting book. Uh, Ezekiel was a prophet for the people of Israel back in the days of the Old Testament. Um, he writes some interesting things, to say the least, in his uh in his uh, the page the pages that he writes in in the Old Testament, um, the text that we're going to look at today is full of all kinds of interesting scenes and words and and images and dialogues and um, man, uh, it's just the Book of Ezekiel is an interesting text to read. Um, the text that we're going to look at today is actually the most well known uh, words from the Book of Ezekiel. In fact, you may even know a song based on uh, our text today. Uh, something, a song that goes along along the lines of dim bones, dim bones, dim dry bones. Uh, yes, or the, the foot bones connected to the leg bone. That is all rooted in the text that we are going to look at this morning. So, tell you what, let's dive in. Um, let me read the text for us. Um, Ezekiel chapter 37 is where this comes from. Uh, if you want to read along, what you can do right now is actually pause the video, grab your Bible, and then flip to it, and then hit play again, or you can just listen as I read uh, today. I'm going to be reading to you from the New Living Translation. This is Ezekiel chapter 37, and I'm going to read the first 14 verses to you. The Lord took hold of me, and I was carried away by the Spirit of the Lord to a valley filled with bones. He led me all around and among the bones that covered the valley floor. They were scattered everywhere across the ground and were completely dried out. Then he asked me, Son of man, can these bones become living people again? O oh, sovereign Lord, I replied, you alone know the answer to that. Then he said to me, Speak a prophetic message to these bones and say, Dry bones, listen to the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says. Look, I'm going to put breath into you and make you live again. I will put flesh and muscles on you and cover you with skin. I will put breath into you and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. So I spoke this message just as he told me. 
Suddenly, as I spoke, there was a rattling noise all across the valley. The bones of each body came together and attached themselves as complete skeletons. Then as I watched, muscles and flesh formed over the bones. Then skin formed to cover their bodies, but they still had no breath in them. Then he said to me, Speak a prophetic message to the winds, son of man. Speak a prophetic message and say, This is what the Sovereign Lord says. Come, O breath, from the four winds. Breathe into these dead bodies so they may live again. So I spoke the message as he commanded me. And breath came into their bodies. They all came to life and stood up on their feet, a great army. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones represent the people of Israel. They are saying, We have become old, dry bones. All hope is gone. Our nation is finished. Therefore, prophesy to them and say, This is what the Sovereign Lord says, O oh, my people, I will open your graves of exile and cause you to rise again. Then I will bring you back to the land of Israel. When this happens, O oh, my people, you will know that I am the Lord. I will put my spirit in you, and you will live again and return home to your own land. Then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken, and I have done what I said. Yes, the Lord has spoken. Join me in a word of prayer, if you would. Father, I am so grateful for, for your word today, as I am every week. But God, I'm especially thankful for your word in moments like uh, the one that we find ourselves in. Lord, I pray that through your word, uh, you would speak today, Father. You would breathe breath and life and hope into your people. God, uh, I want that selfishly, and I want it for us selfishly. But I'm reminded today, Lord, that you, you call us to live far beyond ourselves. And so, Lord, my prayer today is that you would use your word to breathe life into us, not just enough to sustain us, but an overflowing amount of life and breath so that it flows out of us and into the lives of others. Lord, thank you for your love and your grace and goodness. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So this is a, a really fitting text for us today. Um, I think in a lot of ways it's, 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 it's fitting uh, because the Israelites were in exile. When God gave this vision to Ezekiel, Ezekiel to give to the Israelites, they were in exile. Exile means that, that um, their country and their cities and their towns and, and even their homes were all gone. Uh, they, and they had all been invaded. Their, their land had been invaded. They as people had been defeated in battle and forced off of their land and overtaken by this overwhelming sense of, of hopelessness. In all kinds of ways, life was unfamiliar and, and uncomfortable and, uh, and, uh, and downright scary. Um, the future... Uh, uh, of who they were and of what they were and, and what they knew. All of that was in, in question. As I was thinking about all those things earlier this week, I thought to myself, man, uh, some of those things remind me a whole lot of kind of where we are in, in our lives right, right now. Um, I wonder if you've been in a situation lately where you've just felt kind of, of hopeless, um, I don't know that I guess part of that feels like a really dumb question because I would imagine if you're anything like me you you've found yourself in several situations lately where you've been kind of down um on a lighter note when I look out at my yard as I am right now actually um <laughs> I'm kind of filled with a sense of hopelessness um I I see all of the lumps man our our builder did a terrible job smoothing out our yard and so there are lumps all over the place and and I know that just under the, the brand new sod that we have, there is, there is orange dirt that they backfilled to get our foundation to the right level. And there's just no nutrients at all in that orange, orange stuff. Um, our, our trees are in desperate need of, of shaping and trimming. And there's still vines hanging out of them from when they, they cleared off our, our lot. And it just needs a, a ton of work. I, my yard is half as green as my neighbor's is. And, uh, and I, I don't know, I look at it and I just see all kinds of work, which I love that kind of work, but I just don't have time to tend to it right now. And so it leads to just this sense of, of hopelessness. Um, you know, in light of a lot of situations that I've heard about lately, uh, there's really that's really a pretty light sense of hopelessness. Um, I read a, a newspaper article earlier this week. Um, it was in the Kansas City Star, and it was um, about a 
about a man in Kansas City who who passed away recently. Um, he was in his in his seventies, and it was COVID nineteen uh, that was the reason for his passing. But man, the article just broke my heart. And um, and so what had happened? Uh, he was a uh, he was a, a teacher for part of his career, and a biology teacher, and then he became a school principal and uh, and, and worked most of his working years in in education and. And on, on the side, he was also a magician. And in, my, and in my mind, I just, I think of folks I've known in life that have been magicians. And it takes a special kind of person, a really engaging person, and a really uh, personable person, a person with good people skills to be a magician. And that's the kind of guy, uh, that, that's what he did. And so in my mind, he was just, just sort of a super fun-loving guy. And anyway, uh, according to the article, he, uh, a few weeks ago, he began to feel ill. It's about three weeks ago. And, uh, and for about a week, he had sort of flu-like symptoms and, and dealt with it for about a week until finally he decided to go to urgent care. And, and so he went to one urgent care on a Friday, and, uh, and, and they essentially told him that he just needed to, to get some rest and drink some fluids, and they sent him home. And so he went home, and the next day he didn't feel any better, so he went to another urgent care, and, and at that urgent care... They tested him for influenza A and influenza B, and, and those tests came back negative. And so, again, they told him that he just needed to go go back home and, and get some rest. And, and so then on Sunday, his wife made a social media post and talked about the fact that he was starting to feel better. But, but toward the end of Sunday, he really took a turn for the worse. And so early, early in the morning on Monday, he went to the hospital, to the ER, and they admitted him. And and uh, they did a chest scan, and it turned out that he had bilateral pneumonia, and they still didn't have a, enough. Uh, he still didn't have enough symptoms for them to, to test for COVID nineteen. But within the next day or so, they did, and they finally tested him. And sure enough, he had COVID nineteen, and so that meant that he had to to then be quarantined, and his wife had to be quarantined. And so his his wife uh, in the article begins to talk about what it's like to, for her to be at home and her husband to be in the hospital. And she talks about the fact that every single day he got worse and worse. And finally, toward the end of the week, the, the doctors called them in, the whole family, and, and they couldn't even go in the hospital. They were going to have to meet in the parking lot. And as she was getting herself together for that meeting, the, the nurse that was tending to her husband called and said that he had, he had slipped away. In the, uh, the, the newspaper um, quotes uh, a part of what the the wife posted on social media. She talks about that meeting and, and what it was like to stand there with her kids and, and how difficult it was for them to, to sort of wrap their minds around what was happening. And then she talks about going home and she talks about going into her house and the, the finality of the situation setting in and, and coming to the realization that, that her husband was gone, that, that he would never walk through the door again and and then she realized that she now would have to be in quarantine again for another 14 days and and she tried to wrap her brain around what it meant to even begin to plan for a funeral and to be alone while grieving the loss of her husband and and not being able to have company and man as I as I I read her words in that article I just found myself sinking into this deep pit of of hopelessness Friends, when we hear Ezekiel's words in our text this morning, the, the idea is for this huge, inescapable pit to develop within us. Uh, we're not just meant to get the idea that hope is gone from the people of Israel. We're meant to get the idea that almost every last uh, trace of hope is gone. And Ezekiel moves us in that direction through, through some of the images he uses to describe the, the situation. One of those images is a valley. He talks about a, a, a valley that all of these bones are, are laying in. I wonder if you've seen any valleys lately, if you've ever been to a valley in your life. As I was contemplating that, that whole valley scene in my mind, uh, I, I came to the realization or remember that I grew up in a place called the Arkansas River Valley in west central Arkansas. But, but that's not the place my brain goes when I think about this valley that Ezekiel was describing. Um, the valley my brain goes to is actually... In, uh, in New Mexico. It's the valley that the city of Albuquerque sits in. Um, we, uh, we did a, a mission trip um, out to Albuquerque a few years ago, the church that I was on staff at in Kansas. And, um, and, and part of that trip, we went up on Sandia Mountain, which just sits, I think it's either to the east or the northeast of Albuquerque. And Albuquerque is right at the foot. And the elevation of Albuquerque is about 5,000 feet, but Sandia Mountain, Mountain rises up to 10,000 feet. 
So at the top, at Sandia Peak, you're looking down on the city from 5,000 feet up, and you realize when you're up that high, you see this huge, expansive valley that the city is sitting in. And from the foot of the mountain in the city there, you see the land steadily begin to rise to the other side where it rises toward another incline. There's just this this wide open valley. And in the desert southwest, there's not an abundance of trees. And so it's just this huge, wide open space. And when I think about this valley of dry bones that Ezekiel sees, that's the, the setting that my brain sees, just this wide open expanse and bones, bones just as far as the eye can see. Uh, another detail that, that we're meant to pick up on from Ezekiel um, is the fact that that these bones were scattered, like they had been scattered out, and that means that they'd been there for a while. Um, it takes some time for our bodies to to break down and for our tendons and, and ligaments and all those things to let loose, and and so it takes some time for bones to separate from one another. So so we're meant to pick up from that detail that these bones are scattered, that they've been there for a while, have been lying around for a while, and and he also uh, and also. Where that brain leads my, or that that um, that idea leads my brain is to the podcast that I talked about uh, during Ash Wednesday. If you were there for our Ash Wednesday service, I talked about one of my favorite podcasts, which is called Criminal. One of my favorite episodes ever is is when the host of Criminal visits a body farm in San Marcos, Texas, called Freeman Ranch. And at Freeman Ranch, they do all kinds of experiments on bodies. Now these bodies are people that have donated themselves and and they do research uh, it's criminal research um, it's so that they can learn how the body decomposes in different um, areas and, and places and situations so that um, in the future they can um, they can they can document those things and it can help solve criminal cases and those kinds of things but but they lay bodies out in the open at Freeman Ranch, and they 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 study how how fast the body decomposes and and how long it takes critters uh, to to tear bodies apart and and all those kinds of things. And they very carefully document the research, but but it takes time. Like it just takes time for the human body to get to the point where where it bones can be separated out. So so again, Ezekiel is wanting us to to know that that. It's not as though people just fell and died in this valley and we're looking at it the next day, but these bones have been there for a while. Like this situation is is bad. It's dire. Another detail that Ezekiel mentions is that it's dry, right? It's dry. These bones are dry. The life is, is all life is gone from them. When I was in Albuquerque a few summers ago, I remember standing on the top of Sandia Peak and looking down in the valley and, and I very distinctly remember a green streak that sort of wound its way through the middle and that green streak was the Rio Grande, the Rio Grande River, and uh, and and very much of uh, most of the other landscape was brown, but but this streak was very green. It's because there was water, and where there's water, there is life. And if you'll remember, there is no mention of water whatsoever in in Ezekiel's vision, and it's because there is absolutely no life whatsoever. Now, if we were in the sanctuary together right now, I would ask you, how are you feeling? How are you feeling right now? Are you feeling kind of sad and and depressed and and maybe even a, a little bit hopeless? And if you are, then then I think you are feeling exactly the way that Ezekiel would want you to feel. But but Ezekiel would never want you or us to stay there. He wants us to keep moving. So what Ezekiel wants us to know next is that in spite of what seems to be an overwhelming sense of doom and gloom, there's hope, right? There's hope. So one of the places in the text where we can find hope is in verse 2. Verse 2 begins like this, he led them all around among the bones. He led me, I'm sorry, he led me all around among the bones that covered the valley floor. In my mind's eye, when I when I picture those words, I see a valley filled with bones, and amongst those bones are narrow, well-traveled uh, paths that just weave all over the place. They're not really planned out; they're just sort of random paths, but they're they're well-traveled paths. Now, when I think about narrow and well well-worn paths, my brain immediately jumps to the realm of mountain biking. Uh, I don't know if you've ever been mountain biking before. I'm not talking about some kind of paved trail that 
that families ride on, but a real mountain bike trail, like a like a a single track uh, trail that goes that goes. Uh, up really high and, and steep drops and all kinds of crazy things. Um, I went through a season of life where I, I really loved mountain biking. Um, season of life was about 10 years or so ago. And, and believe it or not, it had such an impact on me that to this day, I still have my mountain bike. I haven't ridden it forever, but man, we keep dragging it from place to place with us. And I swear that one day I'm going to get back into to mountain biking because I so loved it. So just after I graduated from college, um, Stacy and I graduated from college, we, we had friends that also graduated from college, and his name was Brian, and her name was Julie, and they were getting married in October, and Stacy and I were getting married in December, and so Stacy and Julie lived together, and then uh, Brian and I lived together, and then when we all got married, we swapped. But during that season, um, I, Brian and I were between college and seminary, and so really we were just working and saving money and getting ready to get married, and so we had a little bit of spare time, at least more than we were used to, and, and Brian had been a road biker growing up, but but he got a mountain bike, and, and, and I did the same thing, and we started riding like crazy, and um, I mean, I remember uh, oftentimes we would come back from riding to, uh, to Stacy and Julie at home, and we would be beat up and bloody. And we would have just had the time of our lives, and they thought we were just crazy. We were crazy. But, man, it was so much fun. One of our favorite places to ride in those days was a place called Draper Lake, and it was on the, the southwest corner, uh, southeast corner of Oklahoma City. And, and the trail there that I remember the best, that I love the most, it, it weaved back and forth through this really deep creek bed. And so you, there were just these bursts of speed where you'd, you'd fly down into this creek bed, and you'd you'd have to have some speed in order to pop back out on the other side. And so this on this particular day, we were weaving back and forth across this creek bed, and it was a great day. And, uh, and I, I remember um, I was leading this day, and so I went down and in. And, and when you went in, it was so steep, the trail was so steep, that if you didn't put all your weight back behind your seat, you'd go over your handlebars. And so, so I had gone down and in and popped back up, and I was getting ready to turn and go back down the, the next side where the next trail was, and I hear this giant commotion behind me. And so I, I stop as quick as I can. I turn around and look, and my buddy Brian is just, is, I see this pile in the middle of this creek bed of, of body and bike and gear and all kinds of things in this huge cloud of dust. And initially, I'm, I'm afraid, like, I, like this looks bad. And so I'm thinking my, my buddy Brian's hurt. But just within a second, he looks up at me. And he grins from ear to ear, and there's not a one of his teeth that's not just covered in dirt. And it's an image that I will take with me for the rest of my life. I will never forget it as long as I live. And in that moment, he was fine, and we both cracked up and had the best time. And it took him a little bit to get all that dirt out of his mouth. But man, it was so funny. So the, the best mountain biking trails, they're narrow, and they're, they're tight, and most importantly, they'll, they're well-worn, and they're smooth, right? And what that means is you can fly through them because you know what's coming. You know they're well-worn, and they're smooth. You don't have to worry about roots in the trail and all those kinds of things. You don't have to worry about getting slapped in the face with tree branches, which is super annoying. But, but trails that are, are well-worn, you don't have to worry about those things. You can just jump on them and absolutely fly. Now, in thinking back to, to our text, um, our, our Ezekiel text that we're working with, and especially those first few words of verse 2, where, where God leads Ezekiel all around and, and amongst the bones in the valley, in my mind, the, the paths that God leads Ezekiel down are, are smooth, and they're, they're really well-worn, and it's more than obvious that they are used and traveled upon constantly, constantly. That's one of the things that that keeps a trail uh, smooth and well-worn is it just has traffic on it all the time. And these paths in my mind are just, they're as smooth as they can be. And again, in my mind's eye, as Ezekiel is, is following God's lead along these paths, and something catches Ezekiel's eye, and, and then it captures his complete attention. And he begins to notice that, that every single footprint along the paths are exactly the same. They're the same shape, the same size, all of them exactly the same. And again, in, in my mind, in that moment, Ezekiel has this epiphany. And he realizes that these paths haven't been 
been worn or made by, by multitudes of people, but instead they've been well worn by just one. Just one. And that one, friends, is the one who is leading them. It is God himself. What the paths through the bones mean to us today, friends, is that it's not just in the seasons of goodness and plenty in life. God moves amongst us, but he is also amongst us during the moments when we feel as though we're alone and we're in exile. And not just in those moments, but especially in those moments. Friends, in these days of of isolating ourselves and social distancing and retreating to the safety of our homes, but yet the loneliness of our homes, may you know today, beyond the shadow of a doubt, that there are are well-worn paths around our lives too, and and not just our lives today, friends, but there are well-worn paths around our hearts. Those paths are completely and totally covered in the footprints of the God who loves us and who will never leave us and never forsake us. If we were together, I would tell you, man, that is a great place for an amen. If you tuned in today to hear some good news, you will not hear any better news than that uh, in this message today. As I I, I mentioned earlier, I, I preached on today's gospel, or I preached on today's gospel text from the lectionary a few weeks ago. And so if you'll remember in that story, a good friend of Jesus' named Lazarus passes away. And, and by the time Jesus gets to where Lazarus is, he's been dead for, for four days. And, and the funeral ritual has already begun, and it's well underway. And the family is gathered, and, and the mourners are gathered. And life is pretty much as far from normal as it can be. Speaking of those kinds of moments in life, can I just confess for all of us that, that life gets super weird uh, when a loved one passes away, man, isn't everything just so awkward when when we lose a loved one? You gather with family members that you don't often gather with. Your your life just gets awkwardly put on hold for a few days, and and you replace your normal eight hour uh, job with eating eight hours a day. Right? Somebody can say amen to that if you've been there. You remember that. Uh, life morphs into some sort of bizarre place that is just about everything except for normal, right? One of my favorite parts of the Lazarus story is Jesus isn't the least bit afraid of the pain and the sadness that accompanies his friend's death, right? He, he doesn't shy away when he's confronted by Lazarus's sisters and their questions about why he didn't come sooner and And he doesn't bat an eye when onlookers murmur amongst themselves and they share their doubts with one another about him. And and nor does he even give opening Lazarus' grave a second thought when he's warned about how bad it's going to smell in there. Instead, friends, he barges straight into the awkwardness and the loneliness and the sadness that has taken Lazarus' family hostage in the midst of doom and gloom and death, he brings about goodness and hope and life. Friends, this is who God is and this is what God does. And it wasn't just way back then that God showed up on the scene in those kinds of ways, but he's still doing it today. Friends, he's still showing it today. My hope for us today Uh, My hope for me today is that we might know that that God isn't absent from nor afraid of the the strange and foreign and awkward season of life that we find ourselves in these days. And my hope for us as well is that, that knowing that God isn't absent might set us free from our fear and our worry and and our anxiety. In verse 3, and moving back to the Ezekiel text, verse 3, God asks Ezekiel a question. And it's a question that God already knows the answer to. Uh, The question is, can these bones become living people again? I wonder if some of us might be asking some similar kinds of questions today. As as we look around at our world and we see the chaos and the craziness uh, that continues to unfold, I, I wonder... If, if I am the only one who, who has struggled a bit this week with questions like, will life ever feel normal again? 
Or will I ever stop being afraid? Or when will this situation stop getting worse and start getting better? Can I tell you this morning, friends, that that God already knows the answer to that question. And I couldn't believe any more than I do right here, right now, that his answer sounds a whole lot like uh, these words that God asked Ezekiel to speak in verse 12. Oh, my people, I will open your graves of exile and cause you to rise again. And when this happens, you will know that I am the Lord. I will put my spirit in you and you will live again. Man, those are good words. Good words. Friends, I am so thankful this morning that that we don't have to wait until someday for the Lord to to live in us. Uh, If you are a follower of Jesus today, then His Spirit is alive in you right now. Friends, but I can't help but wonder, uh, maybe there's somebody who's tuned in that's not a follower of Jesus. And if you're not, you can be today. Uh, His Spirit can live in you today. Jesus invites us all to to come and to follow Him. And and what that means is model the life that He he lived. And He he invites all of us to live and learn. And and that means to live in relationship with Him and to to learn from the Scriptures. And, And He invites us to be loved and to love. And that means to experience His love and to let that love Uh, so work in us that it works its way out through us into the lives of others. If you're you're watching, friends, and you've never made the decision to follow Jesus, when I pray in just a couple of minutes to wrap up, I hope that you will say yes to to Jesus' invitation to come and to, to follow Him. Just before wrapping up, there's one other way that I can't help but wonder if if God might be inviting some of us to respond today. Uh, In verse 4 of of the Ezekiel text, God says to Ezekiel, Speak a prophetic message to these bones. What what an interesting uh, thing for for God to do. Um, Instead of of, of speaking on his own behalf, instead of just saying the words, God invites Ezekiel to speak for him. Now, don't make the mistake of thinking that this is some kind of power play by God because it's so not that. Um, It's not the scenario where God is sort of acting as master and and proving that Ezekiel is servant. That's not what's happening here. Instead, what's happening is, is God is extending to Ezekiel an invitation. He invites him to play a role in breathing new life into, into these people. Friends, I can't think about that part of the text this morning without thinking about you and, and me and asking the question, how, how is God inviting us to be His voice in, these, in this crazy season that we find ourselves in? And how is God inviting us in the days to come to share light and life and love? And how is God inviting us to reach out and to be His hands and His feet and to extend His love and hope to our world that's honestly afraid and anxious and in desperate need of hope. Let's pray together. Father, thank You. I thank You for, for Your prophet Ezekiel. Thank You for texts that come our way at just the right moments. I'm reminded today, God, that You are the giver of life, the breather of life. Lord, we we look around at our world and and many of us are afraid and we're anxious, um, we're stressed. God, would you just go ahead and take all of those things and Lord, would you replace them with peace? God, would 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 you do things in us that we can't do in ourselves, Father? And Lord, would as you breathe life and light and love and hope into us, God, might you do it so much so that it comes into us and it's so much that we can't contain it, but it flows out of us into the lives of others. I pray that your, your light and life and love would flow out of moms and dads and the kids this week. That would flow out of grandmas and grandpas into, into grandkids and sons and daughters. And, and I pray that it would flow out of aunts and uncles into to nephews and nieces. And I pray that it would flow out of us into to our neighbors and into complete strangers, God. God, use us. Now, Father, there's somebody watching today, listening today, that doesn't have a relationship with you. Lord, may they utilize this moment right now to invite you in, to say, 
to, to pray a prayer that sounds like this. Jesus, um, I accept your invitation to follow. I, I desire for you to, to form and shape me, to be uh, the leader of my life, Lord. Um, would, you, would you receive me? Would you forgive my sin, God? And would you help me to follow you, to be formed and shaped by you and you alone? Father, I pray for that person today. I pray for... I pray for them, pray that you would lead them and guide them, Lord. Give them the courage to reach out, to invite others, to, to celebrate their decision with them and, and to, to help them move in your direction. God, I give you my friends today, the church family that I get to pastor. Lord, would you care for them in the days to come? Use them. So thankful today for your love, grace, and goodness and that you freely give it to us, Father. Thank you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Friends, thanks so much for, for joining together in worship today. I hope you know that you are, are prayed for often, um, thought of often. If you ever need anything at all, please know um, that you can, you can reach out and, and touch base with us, and, uh, and we would love to, to be a part of God caring for you in these days. Hope you have a great rest of your Sunday today, or whatever day it is for you, and just know that you're loved. Thank you for watching. Help us out and press the subscribe button and the like button. Have a good day. Bye!